Welcome to the Paint, Rest, Repeat podcast with Roz Gervais and Laura Day, where we chat about our creative lives as artists while keeping it real and a little bit messy. We're here to inspire creatives just like you to push past those boundaries and make art that you love. Let's dive in. everybody and welcome to another episode of paint rest repeat we have the wonderful tash corbin with us today and tash is an epic inspiration to me um on, in my business but also just as a general generally awesome human um so tash do you want to tell our listeners a bit about you and what you do and who you help and all of that jazz for sure. So I have had my business for 10 years now. I started in 2013 and I support women and non- non-binary people to create and grow their online business using marketing strategies that are consent based, that aren't pushy and spammy, uh, but that are very good at creating connection and really high conversion rates as well. You're epic. I just think it's the it's the heart centered side and the ethical side and also the inc- inclusivity inclusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do they both make sense? Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that really just really really inspires me because I think you know in building a business, um, no matter what stage you're up to, there's a lot of that whole spammy sort of marketing model being spruiked. Mm-hmm. Um, and so your way of doing things is really refreshing so yeah thank you for being such a um I don't know ethical guiding light in the world of business yeah well I I was kind of forced to into creating this because I found that when I started my business even 10 years ago the things that were being taught that you have to do I just didn't like it and um, in my early stages of running my business I was supporting people who were in the healing space or artists or creatives and they didn't like it either and so Um, yeah I think it's just a great way to show up online is knowing that you can be in integrity that you're not using psychological trickery to get people to do something people are doing it because they want to they're interested in you they're interested in what you do yeah I think that's what a lot of artists struggle with Um, you know that pushy sales and it actually feels really uncomfortable for them and it can be um, a real stumbling block for them uh, in earning money um, for their creative talents and building a business and um, I feel like you're a wealth of um, inspiration and knowledge for people starting out in their business so I feel like we're going to have a really awesome (laughs) conversation today but um, we really would like to um, talk to you about mailing list as a topic for today um, and how artists can use that list and engage with their audience and build their art business through through a mailing list um, and you've got some great insight and in, um, some great resources for that um, so I guess my question would be for you like let's start with basics and maybe just where would people start off because um, I, I feel like a lot of listeners um, that we've got on this podcast might be at the real beginning stage. Yeah. So a mailing list is a bunch of emails that you've collected from your audience that they've given you permission to send them regular updates, emails, promos, those sorts of things. There are some very strict privacy and um, consent laws around having someone's mailing list. So they need to have given permission. You always need to have an unsubscribe option, some of those sorts of things. But the good news is that as more and more people have online businesses, there are some amazing tools out there that just take care of all of the legalities for you. So um, for very early starters, I recommend MailerLite as a tool. I'm not an affiliate or anything, but it's the, the best one that I've seen with the most functionality in the free version when you first start out. And for, I think it's up to a thousand people on your mailing list that you're, it's free. So that would be one of my favorites for um, first starting out. Um, And then a tool like that helps you to create the form where people can fill it in and put that on your website or a page that 
invite someone to grab a free resource from you and jump onto your mailing list at the same time. So uh, yeah, that's in a nutshell what having a mailing list is. Uh, as we were talking about before with people going, oh, I don't want to spam people. What I find for my audience and probably your audience as well is that because we don't want to be that annoying spammy person in someone's inbox, we jump to the other end and don't ever email people. And so the first principle of having a mailing list is to know that people who joined your mailing list did so with their own volition mm. and they actually want to hear from you. And I think that's really important to remind yourself. Um, I always talk about a mailing list as like being inviting people to the party at your place. So social media is like we're out, you know, and hanging out in cafes and groups and other spaces. And then we invite people back to our place with getting them onto your mailing list. And if you invite people to a party at your house, be a good host. Make sure that you're in the room. Make sure that people know where the food and beverages are. And that's the equivalent of consistently getting in touch with those people who've given you their email address. This is just so huge, Tash, because that is definitely a thing. It's like <laughs> I've got a couple of people in my in my space who are collecting email addresses because I've suggested it. They've got the email addresses, but it's then, but then what? And it's not, it's not actually the practicalities of but then what. Mm. It's often a lot of mindset work and um, often around um, valuing themselves and self-worth and um, being okay to have a voice and things like that. But also the other one that it makes me think of, which you also might be able to help people is uh, with, sorry, is um, knowing your niche and who are you writing these emails to, you know? And I think there might be something that you could share on that as well, potentially. Yeah, for sure. And I think particularly for artists, um, if people are following you on social media or they've opted into your mailing list, like they've already said, yes, please stay in contact, they already like what you do. They're not going, oh, I think that's gross. I'll sign up to their mailing list. Like it just doesn't happen that way. And so particularly for artists, it can be a struggle sometimes to really get clear on who your niche is because it's really just anyone who finds your art appealing or they're interested in understanding your process or um, they find it inspiring. And so um, when it comes to a creative business like that, I would say at first, just trust that your niche are people who are interested. Your niche are people who find it feeling. You have a very visual business when you're an artist. And so that visual representation of what it is that you do is the perfect siren call for people who are interested in that type of thing or find that type of thing really um, interesting or appealing to come and find out more and to follow on. So whereas if it was more of a service business, like let's say you do websites, I would be like, you really need to know exactly whose websites you're building. When it comes to artists, you actually have a lot more freedom when it comes to niching. Um, and the only thing I would say is when you think about writing to people or inviting people to your mailing list don't think about um, all the people who just want to look and aren't interested in buying from you think about someone who is actively seeking artworks to purchase because if you speak to people in that way or make that assumption about people you won't end up sending a bunch of time wasting emails or almost apologizing for the fact that you sell your artwork. I find that as well with a lot of artists is that when they're sharing emails or content that's behind the scenes or just sharing a piece and not saying it's for sale, they're proud and they're excited and they're, there's no problem. But then there's an email about an exhibition or there's an email about pieces for sale and it's almost like the energy is apologetic, like, oh, I'm so sorry to tell you, but this one's for sale. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I would say when it comes to niche, just assume that the reason people are there is because whether it's today or whether it's a few years from now, they really want one of your pieces on their wall. And when you think about it that way, then you'll speak in a way that's less apologetic and it makes sense to then tell people how they can buy something from you, how they can pay you. 
We were talking to um, Maggie McDonald, who's had quite a, a lot of success in her art career. And the thing that she said is it takes about nine times for people to see our artwork before they convert. So um, I guess this is great, this conversation, um, Tash, because you're encouraging people to um, continually like put their work out there mm. and share their art and put prices on on their work and come um come to the conversation or the or the newsletter list um from a place of um you know I'm I'm excited to share this with you this is my process like this yeah and sharing that that sort of um content mm. for like practical sort of advice would you say like how consistent would people need to be like once a month once every two weeks every week so it depends, like I always say, start with what you know you'll nail. So one of the big um, Ooh, practices. That's good. <laughs> yeah, so one of the big That's practices. it. You can go now, Tash. <laughs> that's it. You're done. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I interrupted. The yeah. people buying from you is if they trust you, right? We're mm. spending a lot of money and hoping the artwork shows up, right? In most cases, we're not buying it in person we're more likely to be buying it online these days mm. and so we want to have trust one of the biggest things that will erode trust is i cannot reliably predict your behavior so if you are here for three weeks in a row and then you disappear for three months i can't trust you right even whether whether it's conscious or subconscious there it creates seeds of doubt is this person legit are they actually going to complete it? Are they going to do that commission for me? Are they going to you know, mess me around a little? Whereas if you just send something once a month, but you do it every yeah. month on the first of the month or the first Friday of the month, and you tell people, I send my emails out on the first Friday of the month, and then you send your emails on the first Friday of the month, you are creating trust. And so I would always recommend start with monthly and nail that consistently. And if you're doing that quite well, then I would move to every two weeks and uh, I would just see what your numbers are in terms of how much people open them, reply to them, click on the links, that kind of thing. For a product business, which, you know, unless you're doing commissions, this is probably a product business. Um, I, I would say probably every two weeks is enough. You can go to weekly if you've got something of value. So if, you if people are very fascinated by your process for example and you've got you want to share bits of your process each week go to weekly or if you are a very prolific creator and you've got new stuff pumping out very consistently you've got a high turnover you could go to weekly uh but i think twice a month is enough and if you just did that consistently think about like that's 24 emails that's 24 sales opportunities, that's 24 connection opportunities. So, and that's one of the reasons why a mailing list is so valuable compared to social media, for example, that whole nine times thing. If you post on social media, people are likely to see one out of 16 things that you post if they're a prolific follower. If they're cold and they're not a follower, they'll see one out of 100. But if they're someone who's quite keen, they'll see about one out of 16. But Every email gets to their inbox. Not every social post gets to their newsfeed. And so that's why a mailing list is so valuable because we can rack up those number of views much faster and cons more consistently than necessarily on social media where you can't guarantee that your posts go into people's newsfeed. Mm. Yeah, one, I love this because mm -hmm. I think, you know, it just comes back to also um, your like your take on things, which I love hearing about in your podcast, which is building a business that suits you, you know, and so creating your email routine that's going to suit you that you can, as you say, that you can nail that you can actually deliver on and be consistent on. Um, but that is a bit of a theme with you as well is the creating a business that suits your your life and your personal situation. Um, and I thought maybe we should explore that Laura as well in regards to our creatives who might have day jobs or who might have busy family lives and they want to get mm. into selling their art, they want to publicly call themselves an artist and really sort of build that 
side hustle to potentially be a career in the future. Um, what are your tips? Like you're like the boundary queen. What are your tips mm. around? I love it. You mm -hmm. inspire me because I have no boundaries. Laura knows this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how, what are your tips around building a business to actually mm. suit you, you know, who you are and your lifestyle? Yeah, this one's going to be tricky for artists, but the biggest <laughs> killer of consistency is perfectionism. And mm. so um, rather than I need the perfectly worded newsletter with the perfect visuals <laughs> at the perfect time, just get it out. And if that means all they get this month is a picture of the last thing you created and a little note saying, I'm so busy this this month, you know, life is mm. getting in the way. People want to hear about behind the scenes. So yeah. I'm just saying like life is getting behind, you know, getting in the way behind the scenes. But I'm so proud of myself because I carved out four hours this week to work on my art and it really filled my cup this week. Even if that's all we hear from you, at least we've heard from you. So um, progress and action over perfection as much as you can. And um, be mindful about what actually contributes to moving the business side forward. Because things like doing, let's say, TikToks or Instagram reels that get tens of thousands of views, whilst very good for our egos, and our egos do need some stroking and nurturing, <laughs> isn't necessarily going to uh, maximize the return, right? So what mm. I would recommend if you're very limited on time, focus on your very hottest audiences first. So if you only have 30 minutes this week to just sit down and get something done, your mailing list is your hottest audience. Make sure yep. that they're looked after. Your next hottest audience are the people who already follow you on social media. So if you use Instagram, that stories or your feed posts are far more important than anything that's gonna reach cold audiences. So something that we can do in business is um, almost mean girl, the people who are around us and make them not count. So, you know, oh, I've only got 15 people on my mail list, so they don't count. They are the 15 people in the world who are most likely to be your next buyer. Yeah. 15. They're the 15. So instead of going, spending all your time going and chasing more friends for them to be on the list, because that doesn't count until there's 150 of them love on those people really hard with the limited time that you have and then move out to slightly colder, slightly colder, slightly colder from there. We can sometimes believe that in order to get the success, we must have certain metrics and that's just not true. I had no one on my mailing list when I got my first client because I just told my friends and work colleagues, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and even artists who make sales to friends and family and they say, well, that doesn't count. That was just my sister. Or that doesn't count. That was my old neighbor. It, the money counts. You can pay yeah. that money. Those people hanging it and loving that piece of art, that counts. That absolutely does count. And so, yeah, that would be the two things. Like don't discredit your biggest fans. Actually, like focus on them first and then, um, yeah, move to the, the colder audiences next with the extra time that you have um and another one um is just don't don't lose your connection to the thing that lights you up about being in business and which is for you the art mm. and so, like if the fastest way to resent your business is to spend hours doing something you don't want to do for no result and so if the marketing side is not your favorite make sure that you prioritize the creation side and boundary up that marketing side. The, the best way to make your marketing feel really easy is it's only 30 minutes, three times a week. If I just, it's like exercise, right? Well, if it's only 30 minutes, three times a week, I can probably handle that. And I love timers. I actually have one here. I hope it doesn't make too much noise, but I have this like little Pomodoro cube and I use this all the time. Like I've got 30 minutes. And so it's a little timer. You flip it up. I think it's turned off. Yeah, it is. And you flip it up and it sets a timer for 30 minutes. So like it's, I create little games with myself sometimes for these things to get them boundaried up and get them done. Um, yeah. And then it, I like the reward is there's more time for the fun stuff. Yeah. The fun stuff is doing things like this, talking, being on video. So I create marketing around talking and being on video. If you love creating, um, you know, the visual side, 
then make your marketing the visual side, like make it be in your wheelhouse. If you love writing, do lots of writing. If you love um, video, do lots of video. Find the way of communicating and expressing yourself that really aligns with you and then find ways to incorporate that into the marketing so it doesn't feel like it's the yucky stuff and then the art is the fun stuff. We make everything as fun as possible and then yeah, just boundary it up. If um, it, I'm sure most people who listen to this know of Liz Gilbert, right? Big yeah. Magic. Mm. So mm. one of the things I love is in her podcast, Magic Lessons, she talks about like your your how you allocate your time reflects your priorities. Not what you say your priorities are, but how you allocate your time. So if your day is wake up, get the kids off to school, kids are at school, first thing you do with free time is clean the house, do the washing. You're saying your priority is cleaning <laughs> your washing. So um, switch, switch it around. Make the yep. first thing that you do the thing that is the priority. If your art is your priority, make that the first thing that you do. And you might have to put some boundaries around it so that the other stuff does get taken care of, but put it first and, and arrange your day so that it reflects what you want your priorities to be as well. I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I had like a million questions. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> pew, pew, pew. I couldn't um, write fast enough for my questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's really interesting to reflect on where you place your energy day to day. And like even just reflecting and taking stock, like from the past yeah. week, yeah, what what were you doing first thing in yeah. the morning? Not cleaning the house. No, not <laughs> cleaning the house for me either. <laughs> something that we also say, this is like my little feminist side coming out, something we also do in my um, classes is we say what would Steve do and Steve is like this fictional middle-aged white man who it's actually my dad's name who I don't who I don't talk to so you know <laughs> <laughs> so it's like we just I was like, well, what would Steve do? Because of particularly for women and people who come from marginalized communities, mm. the the expectation like there's just an automatic expectation that you are in charge of children and meals and cooking and cleaning and all of those sorts of things. And so uh, also just taking some time to reflect on those assumptions of what is actually your job. And if you think of yourself as like Steve the budding artist who he is prioritizing his art you know all those creative mm. artsy dude types in the movies yeah. right does he actually get up and clean his house and have an immaculate workspace and all of those sorts of things in order to be a uh, um a legitimate artist right like no and so sometimes it's about being far more selfish than we've been trained to be mm. um and seeing that selfishness not as a bad thing, but actually as you prioritizing yourself, you are of value, you are worthy. Mm -hmm. Unpaid domestic labor is completely invisible in most cases. And so just even like reflecting on the things that you use as excuses not to paint or the things you use as excuses mm -hmm. not to focus on your business, is that actually your job or is that a standard that society or family structures have imposed upon you that you ha actually can have the power to change. And even if it's the tiniest thing. So um, I talk a lot about outsourcing and bringing in people to help you in your business, that kind of thing. But for women in particular, one of the most powerful things you can do once you get started is actually get help in the home because no one's paying you to clean your toilet. No one is paying you to do the laundry. And that's one of the things where it's a task that you can outsource fairly simply, fairly cheaply, fairly easily, and it creates so much spaciousness. And also I think it helps with um, some of the other mindset pieces around asking for help, being yep. looked after, asking for your needs to be met. There's nothing so triggering in the mindset thing like having to say to someone, oh, could you just do it that way, please? It's brilliant CEO practice for when you are 
you know, a famous artist and a brilliant gallery has asked, how do you want your exhibition set up? You're not going to turn up like a timid mouse who doesn't know how to ask for what they need. You've practiced. You've practiced by hiring a cleaner. You've mm -hmm. practiced by asking for your needs to be met from your friends and family. You've like, we, we need to build these skills to actually be able to be that famous artist you want to be or be that very successful business person that you want to be. Brilliant business people don't avoid asking for their needs to be met. Brilliant business people don't avoid hiring help when they need it. They actually make that decision and invest in those sorts of things. Seeing that their time is one of the most valuable things that they can put into their art and into their business. Yeah, <sighs> yeah the self-worth awesome. the self-worth piece and the having a voice, you know, and speaking up for your mm -hmm. needs. That's just huge, you know, mm -hmm. and I think I don't think it just, you know, I think as you're saying, it's, you, it's something you've just got to practice and yeah. slowly, you, you know, you build up that muscle over time, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm better at it than I used to be, for example, mm -hmm. but I'm still not very good at it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's yeah. Setting up that, um, the structures mm. to support your dreams, isn't it? Yeah. And it is like slowly, slowly. I mean, it took me getting um, diagnosed with a chronic illness to like allow myself to ask for help. So I know that it's really hard for women to mm -hmm. really step out and, and ask, yeah, like you were saying, Tash, for the, your needs to be met. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. things that you find challenging today, you won't find as challenging next time. Mm -hmm. And the things that are, are easier for you now, they were hard the first time that you did it, right? The first time that you posted something on social media, it felt so confronting, but now most people, they can do it. Taking mm -hmm. selfies, right? Like all of those things. So remembering that it won't be as hard next time and it will get easier and easier. And even just acknowledging how far you've come. So being able to say, look, three years ago, I would never have said to my partner, look, my art takes priority. And on Saturdays, I have three hours of studio time regardless, right? Would never have said that, but now that's the situation that we sit in. So it's, it's just remembering it is all a practice and it gets easier and easier as you go. Yeah. I still remember my first live. I always talk about this, my first live on Instagram. <laughs> it was terrible. I could not get off there soon enough and I could not delete it. <laughs> 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 but now I love them they're just fun because it's just like talking to friends you know so mm. um but that's three years ago or something now so yeah yeah you know it just takes, takes practice. Time. Mm. uh interesting turn our um our topic of um newsletters <laughs> <laughs> but I love it I love I love this conversation <laughs> it's so good um, I actually have a practical question, yes. um, which I feel like you would be good at answering. Um, I was listening back to some of your podcast episodes, which um, if people don't know, Tash has um, a podcast called the Heart Centred Business Podcast. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Um, and I, I was listening to your chat with Emily Osmond about Instagram and it was awesome. And I got so inspired by that, but um, you were having a conversation about getting people off Instagram on to your mailing list yeah. like you were saying it's that your warmest audience and it should be where you'll be placing your priority and that's where your customers and sales are going to come from so yeah um some strategies around getting people off instagram onto your mailing list i'd love yeah, to hear what your sure. take so, instagram is a little trickier because you can't have links in your captions so we've got to use the real estate that we have as strategically as possible so the first piece of real estate is always going to be your profile and making sure you have a link that doesn't necessarily go to your, just straight to your website or to your gallery because your Instagram is a gallery. Have that link go to subscribing to the newsletter, right? So stay in touch. Here's the link and it gets them straight onto the newsletter. So I would use that real estate for newsletter rather than gallery or just generic website. Um, because once they're on your mailing list, you're going to send them emails that have your website on there. They, they're going to be able to click over and find the gallery. Um, and if people love you enough, they will keep clicking. They will go and find the thing. So I would, uh, these days, I think you can have two links on Instagram anyway, but if you, if you're going to prioritize one, it would be the mailing list link. The second thing is the stories. You can have links there. So even just having a little alarm on your phone once a week to go and do a story and at the end of that story talk about jumping onto your mailing list so that story could be 
first an image of a piece of art, then an uh, image of you getting frustrated with uh, behind the scenes and then, you know, want to see more, then come and make sure that you're on the mailing list. Or um, if you had an exhibition, you know, some nice photos of the exhibition, maybe a little video debrief of something. And then, by the way, if you want to see more behind the scenes, make sure that you're on my mailing list. So using stories because your hottest audience will see those stories. That's not necessarily going to go to a to cold audiences or strangers. It very rarely gets in front of someone who's not following you. So um, that's also a space to pop um, those links. But even with reels and feed posts, you can get people to opt into your mailing list, especially in the early days. You can just say to people, if you'd like to join my mailing list, let me know and I'll send you the link. So you're getting permission from people to DM them and give them the link to sign up to your mailing list because you can also share links in DMs. So I will often do this myself, even if I'm promoting a free workshop or something along those lines, it's still worth my time to say, hey, I'm running a workshop on how to create an online course. If you want the link, just let me know and I'll DM it to you. And so I will, with a post like that, get 12, 15 people say, oh, yes, please. And then it's worth my time sending that message to those 12 or 15 people. And if we've had a one-to-one -one conversation on DMs, they're far more likely to actually do it uh, than if they just see it and they're like, oh, that would be nice. Oh, no, I don't have time. And they'll just keep scrolling on. Mm. So if they've said, yes, I want to, and you've taken the time to DM them and give them the details and the link, then they're far more likely to actually take action on that than if they were just to see it in the scrolling their feed anyway. Um, so there's a few ways, just thinking about, you know, how could I encourage people to jump on my mailing list with this caption? Or um, how can I encourage people uh, when I've got an opportunity to share a link or something along those lines? Now, one thing I will say to this though, is that I know that a lot of marketers out there recommend there should always be a call to action, but I actually don't think that that's the case. The reason being is if every time I read something from you or see something from you, there's a pitch at the end, it starts to feel like I'm walking through a shopping mall, right? Like, you know, buy from me, oh, do this. And we're instructing people far too much. So um, most people feel relieved when I say this, but you don't need every single post to have a call to action or to tell people to do something or instruct, you know, I'm far less likely to comment on something if it says, comment below and tell me blah, 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 <laughs> because one, I feel like they instruct me in a specific way. If I see an amazing piece of art, for example, I might just want to say, oh, that looks a brilliant or that color palette. Like I'm not, a, I'm not a very, um, uh, what's the word? Like I'm not a, a great lover of art. I'm not someone who really gets into all the detail and that kind of stuff. I'm a, do I like it kind of. <laughs> so It's like um, me and wine. Oh, that yeah. tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, sometimes like the instruction is like, comment below and let me know what your favorite blah, blah, blah is. I'm like, well, no, I just want to say that was pretty. So I'm not going to comment because I'm not able to follow your instructions. So sometimes when you're giving people far too much instruction, they can't actually engage with you in a way that feels natural. Like when you go and have a conversation with someone, you don't go, oh, hey, I like tea. Tell me, do you like tea? Like we don't actually interact with humans that way. Well, I do, Tash. No, just joking. Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so if we, like sometimes we just expect people to come back with something. We don't give them a direct instruction. Okay, now you reply and tell me what your favorite blah, blah, blah is. We don't talk to people that way. So we want social media is social. People are there to be entertained, to be educated, to be inspired, to tune out, to feel connected to people, right? They want to socialize, it's social media. And so I would like, just sometimes it's enough to share something or a thought and just leave it at that. And I'm far more likely if someone says, oh, it took me six hours to convince myself to get something done and then it took me 10 minutes to finish, I am far more likely to go, oh, my gosh, I've been there. I just did that <laughs> yesterday and start a conversation with you than if you did that and then said, tell me, has this ever happened to you, right? It just feels far more formal and far more businessy and marketing-y than if you just share with us. So 
you know, maybe it's once or twice a week. There's something that invites people to your mailing list. It doesn't have to be all the time um, because we want to make sure that we're you know, engaging with people in a human to human kind of way. So backtracking for a second. So I'm thinking of some of our listeners. I can't help it. Um, CTA is a call to action, right? So that's like when you ask someone to do something. So you yeah. do your have your post, and at the end you say comment. I do. I do this task. You can I know. Tell me I'm going to admit I comment. do too. But that's like the marketing rec- rhetoric, isn't yes, it? Like yes. it is. So what was that old man's name? Steve. Uh, uh, Steve. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No, oh, that's the <laughs> entitled um, white man, Steve. Um, oh, no, okay. anyway, yeah, it is the regular marketing re- rhetoric. It's mm. like what you're told to do. Yeah, comment yeah. with a love yeah. heart if mm. you like the colour pink. That's totally <laughs> something I would do. <laughs> <laughs> and so it might be, like the other thing is the algorithms don't like the word comment yes, because that. that is far more likely to be business content and Meta want you to pay to get in front of customers. So even just looking at your captions, being like, "Am I like actually coming across businessy here?" Mm. People, you'll get far more reach with your existing followers if you don't do some of those things. Even things like on Facebook, if you use Facebook, like link in the comments. The algorithm is trained to look for that and give it less reach now. Like the algorithm gets onto these things very quickly, mm-hmm. and so yeah, even just taking out some of that. But it might be like. You might naturally have a question, right? Any pink lovers out there? Great. <laughs> Include that there. That's fine. But it's where it becomes, it's always instructional. Every post, yeah. Every post. It starts to just feel like it's not you, it's your business that's showing up and people want to connect with people. Yeah. It's interesting to backtrack with that a little bit like and to dive a little bit deeper like why do I do that why do people do that and it's because they want engagement with their post which is because you want your post to be um, spread out further which Mm. is because you want to build your business which is because you want to build your income so that you can be the artist you want to be so that you can quit your day job how's that (laughs) (laughs) it's just interesting to Mm. I want to tell people what to do and get them to comment in order to get that engagement and that reach. That logic is actually like fuzzy. Think about when you're on social media and you see content, is the instruction to comment likely to make you like more likely to comment or less likely to comment? Is the instruct if the other reason people do it, I think as well is, We feel like when we show up online, we have to show up as a professional. We have to show up as this like perfect image of an artist. Black Laura. Showing up. (laughs) Rather than showing up as a human. But again, humans love to connect with humans and particularly women. Like I feel like I'm more connected to women about periods than I am about like, you know, my accomplishments because we love a good little, oh, we both have this problem or we both had this challenge or we're both cramping at the moment, you know, like <laughs> that's, the, that's the human to human part. And it takes a bit of practice to stop writing like you're writing for your corporate job. I had to do this myself. I only took photos when I had a full face of makeup and a jacket with shoulder pads. Like I, I was showing up online as a business person but that doesn't necessarily create the engagement that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. It might make you feel more confident and feel better. And sometimes we need to have a little, you know, filter on or our face on to feel like we can show up. But the more consistently you do it, I find the more you're willing to show up as yourself. And it's the post where I say I had a bad day that I get far more engagement than the post where I say everything's working out perfectly. Um, don't be all bad news. And do <laughs> no, I agree. I agree with that. You don't want to pull people down, but you do. Yeah. Want to agree. Like, yeah. It's just that humanness or that mm. like willingness to like show that you haven't got it all figured out mm. or that, that relatable moment, the relatable moment might be, I actually, I follow quite a few artists on Instagram and an artist was like, I have been talking myself into sharing this unfinished piece of art with you for the last 20 days. And I just today decided that today was the day. This is not finished. Like in capitals, this is not finished. (laughs) Needed to show the progress. And Mm. like, I was like loving it. 
commenting, cheering her on because we also, we want the people that we follow to succeed. We want, like, we want everyone to do really well. Those people who are following you aren't following you because they're looking for that flaw or looking to catch you out in failure. They're actually following you because they want to support you. And so giving them an opportunity to do that by showing up as a human will create far more engagement than the directions to engage will ever do. Yeah. All right, fine. I'll change my <laughs> evil ways. Um, <laughs> this has been just epic. And I yeah. know that you've got a couple of um, like free training offerings that might suit our beautiful listeners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think given that we're talking about mailing lists, the, the key one is called Grow Your Audience. And mm -hmm. it looks at the different audiences you have with an online presence. So things like social media, having a mailing list. And it dives deep into how to grow your mailing list audience. So if people are wanting to get people onto their mailing list, uh, grow their audiences, I think that that would be a great free training for them to check out. Awesome. Well, we'll pop all the links down below the show notes. So um, beautiful listeners, make sure you go and check out the show notes so that you can go and steal that freebie. Um, everything Tash does is gold. I'm just letting you know, um, 100%. <laughs> genuinely mean that because so definitely go and grab this freebie don't miss out um because it's going to be amazing I haven't checked it out but I just know everything I've done in your world Tash is just amazing so yeah go and get I amongst also, it people I also just quickly <laughs> want to say the great thing for people who listen to this podcast is that I actually my business like the courses that I sell and the VIP work that I do is not with artists. So I want you to just go and use all my free resources and all my free content. I don't want you to pay me anything because I'm not an artist myself. And I feel like if you want to work with a mentor on your art business, that sort of thing, you're better off working with someone like Roz. You're better off like working with someone who understands what it is to be an artist but my free resources are yours to go and just make the most of. So you can also be very confident that even if you do one of my freebies and there's a promo or something at the end, that is not for you. So don't even worry about it. Oh, Tash. Honestly, honestly, I, I do work with artists, but there came a point in my business where I was like, I don't have the experience of making decisions around artistic integrity versus commercial appeal. And I am not equipped to mentor people in that space. And so I would rather that they work with someone who has that experience as an artist and can help guide them through that process. And so just take all the free stuff and know <laughs> there's guilt free. You do not ever have to buy anything from me. Yeah, <laughs> she's a goodie. Laura does mentoring, artist mentoring as Ooh, well. Amazing. We like to like, um, what's the word? We like to banter about like if it's it's all right if you choose mentoring with <laughs> instead of me. It's not like a popularity contest. No, and we know <laughs> that a rising tide lifts all ships, right? So we it's all awesome. get to enjoy the benefit of each other's success because especially again women and people from marginalized communities we're the ones who take those around us with us so when someone succeeds they take others with them and mm. so i love that collaborative you know no competition kind of way of doing business because some people don't like the sound of my voice some people don't like my one wonky eyebrow <laughs> <laughs> someone else is going to be better to support them I would rather that they just get the support, right? Like I want us all to succeed and to get art and creative pursuits out there and um, into the spotlight as very legitimate career choices um, because then rather than seeing women in their 40s who were told being an artist is not viable and then went into the law or accounting or you know, sucked their souls out for 20 years mm. in the workplace and then have to do this on the side or while they're on maternity leave. I would rather people are just encouraged into the arts straight out of school as a legitimate career choice. And that takes all of us showing up and succeeding in these spaces so that there's more people can see just the plethora of people who have successful businesses in these spaces. Wow, oh, Tash. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. We could keep going. I know, I know. Um, um, but I know you, you have to leave. So <laughs> you've got a busy day ahead. 
No worries at all. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thanks yeah. so much, beautiful Tash. Um, this episode was gold and listeners, I hope that you enjoyed tuning in. If you are listening and not watching, you can actually go over to YouTube to watch us in person um, and to re-listen, re like take some notes, you know, focus in, hone in. <laughs> get those notes down um and if you did enjoy the listen today please make sure that you share over on your socials so that we can help even more creatives on their way that's it from us wonderful thanks, <laughs> thanks for you, joining everyone. us bye <laughs> bye